Okay, so uh, we've just finished going over the exam solution. And as far as announcements, I'll point out that homework 12 has a pretty quick turnaround. Because of the simplicity of that assignment, um, it's due on Thursday. So that's just uh, two days from today. And it's covering the material that we're going to discuss in class today. Uh, and then the next thing that's on your schedule is the project. And I've had a few people stop by to double check their uh, getting started solutions. And once you have that done on paper, then it's really easy to transfer it into Excel and be confident that your spreadsheet's doing what it needs to be doing to answer the rest of the questions on the project. Uh, this is a busy time of year because everyone's starting to think about registration for the, uh, for the spring semester. And so I, I'm having a lot of students stop by with registration questions. And so just to let you know, it's better for you to you know, start on this as early as possible because if you stop by and I'm doing registration appointments, you may have to wait a little bit. OK, so today we're going to um, talk about chapter 12, budget limits, capital rationing, and then just uh, get some initial exposure to some of the ideas in chapter 13, which will continue in a future lecture as well. Uh, capital rationing is the idea that every company has a limit to the amount of money that they either have on hand or that they can borrow. And we've seen those curves that show that as the cumulative amount borrowed increases, so do the borrowing costs. Because remember, there's a greater risk to a lender as the number of loans you have outstanding increases. There's uh, increased risk of default. So what that means is that Every company, whether it's a, well, every organization, whether it's a company or even um, governmental organizations like municipalities, states, the federal government, has a limit on the amount of money that's available. And so you may have a lot of really exciting, spectacular projects that are being proposed. And these are all projects that were proposed over in Dubai, uh, the Palm Island, the Burj Khalifa. And then there was some idea of an underwater hotel. Now, of those three options, these two got constructed. The Palm Offshore Island, that's real. The Burj Khalifa is real. But as far as I know, they haven't quite gotten around to the hotel yet because you can't do every project. You have to make choices. You have to prioritize. And one of the ways that you can prioritize, prioritize is by performing a capital budgeting study. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to um, estimate all the permutations, all of the different combinations of projects that you could perform, and identify what combination of alternatives is going to yield uh, the best result. So you develop a cash flow estimate for every project, and then you go through the process of saying, we'll fully do this project. There isn't any sort of partial completion. And then you'll accept the, the full consequences of completing a project. So that means you look at the alternatives, how much they're going to cost, how much they're going to return, and then you compare different packages of alternatives. And the budget constraint tells you how many of those packages you can accept. And so you look at the combined price of certain different combinations. You know, A, B, and C, if you do all three of those, how much is it going to cost? Or if you just do A and C, what would be the combined cost there? And you look at the revenue of every different combination of packages, and then you'd select the one with the highest combined revenue. Your objective then is to just maximize the return on investment on an absolute basis. It's to maximize the, uh, the, the profits. And the best way to know, because sometimes projects have different time frames, the best way to know what is the uh, best alternative is to take everything to the present. And that's, you know, the present value analysis is something we've done on several previous <coughs> occasions. And so this, the, the underlying ideas are the same. You've already done the cash flows. You've already done present worth analysis. Now we're just combining different packages together. So as an illustration, this is what we're kind of saying. We're saying there's Project A, Project B, and Project C. And they have different lifespans. They've got different initial investments, different uh, cash flows over time. You find the amount that is required to do all three of these. You find the amount that's required to do two and every possible combination of two, and then also every possible combination of one. And then the final alternative is do nothing. And that's one that we always have to consider is the do nothing approach. Because in some cases, 
That'll be the most profitable thing, is to just not select any of the options that you have available. Uh, so to uh, try this out, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the possibility of what if there are four projects and there's uh, bundling is the idea of putting different combinations together. And you may remember from math, how do you find out the different number of, the total number of combinations that there are? Mm -hmm. The total number of choices, how do you find out how many there are? So if there's four projects, how many combinations are there? Do you remember that? How many combinations? So there's, you know, there's like A, B, there's C, D. How many combinations should we be looking for if there's four options to begin with? That's question A. For above, how many possible bundles are there? So write them down in the space below A, you know, it's really small, right? Okay, one of the combinations is A, B, C, D. One of the combinations is A, B, C. One of the combinations is uh, A, B, D, and so on. And we should be looking for a total of 16 different combinations, including the do nothing combination. Okay, so all the possible combinations, we're going to assume that BD is not distinct from DB. Like those are essentially the same because it means you're doing project B and you're doing project D. And so uh, you might have constructed some duplicates, but there are only 16 unique alternatives when we eliminate those duplicates. Okay, so. The next question is, what is the initial investment required for each bundle? If you have Excel available, so if you brought your computer, why don't you go ahead and get it out. And uh, we're going to calculate the cost of each combination and also do an if statement to uh, tell us whether it's feasible according to the budget limit.
So we want to calculate the cost for each possible bundle. So for instance, the bundle AB is going to be the combined cost of A and B, and so on and so forth for all of the bundles till we know uh, the cost for each, and then we'll do an if statement to tell us whether it's feasible. And by the way, how did we know that 16 were possible? If we go back to here, it says that if you have M projects, there's two to the M possible bundles. So there's four projects. Two to the fourth is two times two times two times two. That's 16. So here we have the 16 possible bundles. And then this budget limit is 23,500. And so what that means is that if a project costs that much, it's feasible if it costs more then it's not feasible so we want to use the if then so that we don't have to manually type yes or no for all of them so let me show you uh, how we can use an if statement so we start up with equals since it's a pre-existing formula in Excel and uh, let me make that a bit bigger so it's easier to see all right so it's equals if and now it says logical test and so our logical test will be if the cost is uh, greater than or equal to this budget limit, I'm going to anchor the reference there, then, now if true, I'm going to in parentheses say yes, so if it is uh, greater than or equal to 20, negative 23,500, so meaning um, not as negative, then that's why it's a yes, is because we've got minus signs here since these are all costs. So then it would see like negative 5,500, since that number is greater than negative 23,500, then it's going to say yes, it's feasible. But down here, when it sees the 25,000, since tw negative 25,000 is not greater than or equal to our budget limit, then it will say no. And you have to put those parentheses in there if you want to use text. Okay, so it's saying, yes, it's feasible. 10,000 is inside the budget limit. And we can drag this down. And if we had lots of combinations, more than 16, we'd be really grateful to have this automatically kind of identifying it. So you can see here it triggered the no.
for this 25,000. Now let's double check this 23,500. It is feasible because it ex it's exactly the budget limit. If we do project C and D together, it's exactly the budget limit, so it should be acceptable, and it is picking that up. Our logic statement here, greater than or equal to the limit, meaning not as negative, then it's a yes. So everything is good in that uh, sort of initial screening of which packages are feasible and which ones aren't. Any questions about this first part? Okay. So once I execute that, it tells me, for instance, that 10,000 in cost is okay because 10,000 in cost isn't as expensive as 23,500 in cost. So I apply that same decision all the way through. The last one that's acceptable is combination CD, because it's right at the limit. That's why I couldn't just do greater than. I had to do greater than or equal to to pick up this alternative. So how many feasible bundles are there? Let's see, we're rejecting one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are 16 bundles in total. Six of them aren't feasible because they exceed the budget limit. That means that there are 10 feasible bundles. 10 feasible bundles. All right. So now the next step of how we do capital rationing is once we've identified how many bundles are feasible based on the limit, now we want to find out which alternative is best, which combination of alternatives is best. So let's copy over all of our feasible bundles into another table. And so a good way to do that is down here at the bottom, see where it says Sheet 1? If you right click on that, you can create a copy. So create a copy of your spreadsheet. And so uh, one of them is just going to be like bundles. And then the other one, we're going to change and make it capital rationing. OK, so in the capital rationing, let's delete um, any one of these options that isn't feasible. So this one's not feasible, so we just delete it. All of these are not feasible, so we delete them. So these are all of the, the packages that remain acceptable. I'll just sort of put them together here. So those are our feasible bundles. And what we want to do is add some columns to it, the annual net cash flow, and from that find the present worth of the bundle. So here, this next column tells us the annual net cash flow for each option. So let me copy that data over to the spreadsheet. So now, ooh. OK, so the annual net cash flow, that means the, uh, the revenue minus the annual operating costs. Now, in this next part of the in-class exercise, on your paper, under part two, it says there's an eight-year duration, and the company's MAR is 12%. So what we're going to have is N equals eight, and I, oh, I can't put it there. It won't be useful. Uh, N equals, and then the next cell, eight, and I equals and 0.12. And the reason why is um, I'm going to have both the uh, annual net cash flow for each combination. And then I'm going to find the present worth of the bundle.
Okay, so the annual net cash flow of A is just this one. And it, you'll notice that it's positive, whereas our costs were negative. For B, annual net cash flow, C, D. A, B, you need to find the combined annual net cash flow for each alternative bundle. So now for the present worth of each bundle, what we're going to do is we're going to combine this initial cost with the present value of these recurring payments. And so remember from down here, there's eight payments of this amount at an interest rate of 12. And so what we want to do is the present worth will be uh, the PV of this annual cash flow. So we, for the rate, we'll use, click here on where it has the 0.12 and anchor the reference. N is going to be eight years. Again, I want to anchor that. And the recurring payment, I'll have the negative sign because it always flips, you know, with Excel, minus of the annual net cash flow. So what that's going to do is it's going to tell me the present value of eight payments of 2,500. But this is the present worth of the entire bundle, including the initial cost. It's not just the present worth of the annual net cash flow. So then after the PV function, I have to add in the initial cost. So it's the present worth of the revenue, essentially. The present worth of the revenue plus the initial cost will be the overall present worth of the bundle. So then that says, if we do combination A, the overall present value of that project is 24,000, I'm sorry, 2,419. And I can drag this formula down and it'll calculate the present worth of all of the bundles. And from this, we can finally now decide which alternative is best. We want the most money. And so we can find out with the max function equals max, you know, in this range, which of them is the most? Like what is the highest amount? And it's the one that's 4,351. So this is the max. And we can make it easier to spot by doing a conditional formatting. And that might be something that you remember from when you took 111. You highlight all of the cells, and you go here up into the ribbon under conditional formatting. And let's create a new rule under conditional formatting. So if you click on new rule and um, format only the top or bottom ranked values. We want to the top one and the format that we'll set for it, we'll click here on the format button. Format it so that it is bold. And so then once we apply that, it'll automatically in this range look at all those values and format the one that's the highest. So that's another way to spot when you have lots of alternatives which one is the best. So the in-class exercise asks, what should we do? Which bundle should be selected? And once you go through this process of finding the cost for each bundle, the combined revenue for each bundle, you know, screening out the ones that aren't feasible, 
The bundle that should be selected is bundle AC. And it's not the one that was most expensive. If you look, bundle CD was more expensive, so it's not necessarily going to be the case that the most expensive option is the one that gives you the highest profits. In this case, project A and project C gave us the maximum present worth, that 4,351. So that's the greatest present worth of all the bundles, so that's the one that we should do. Capital rationing is uh, fairly simple compared to some of the stuff that you've done already. So I think you'll find that this assignment flies by pretty easily. It's due on Thursday. All right, uh, let's talk about now the relationship between how much things cost and how much demand there is for them. How many people here have taken an economics class before? Maybe like macroeconomics? Anybody taken any kind of a econ class? I'm surprised. Usually there's been at least a few. Even though you've never taken an econ class, you probably know that what's the relationship between price and demand? If prices go up, what happens to demand for a certain item? Classical economics say that if prices go up, demand what? It goes down, right. And so think about your own life. You know, if, uh, if airline tickets cost more, you maybe fly less. Then if airline tickets get cheaper, people fly more. And that's actually been the trend in the, in the United States. When airlines were deregulated in the early 1980s, uh, air traffic kind of exploded. So what we're going to talk about is the relationship between price and demand, but then we're going to throw in one other factor. And that is, when costs are accounted for, how many items have to be sold so that you can be profitable and break even. So um, this discussion starts with, uh, since Thanksgiving is approaching, one of our fam my family's Thanksgiving traditions is you go out, buy the newspaper, and that's the thickest one of the year, right, um, on Thanksgiving Day, because it has all of the circulars for the sales that are going to happen on Black Friday. And by the way, I've taught this class outside the United States, and when I told people about the fact that people will line up, you know, starting at 2 a.m., they thought it was the most insane thing they ever heard. You know, we're saying, well, you could go get a Fitbit for $40 off, and so see how it works is you go line up at Best Buy at midnight, and then when they open their doors at 6 a.m., you get your Fitbit for $40 off, and you only spent six hours in the cold uh, when you should be asleep. So you saved money. And they think, well, isn't your time worth anything? And then, of course, there's always the riot videos you see, like on YouTube, people getting into fist fights, trying to take the last toaster, that sort of thing. So Black Friday is a, is a you got to be in the United States to appreciate it, because people in other countries just, they don't quite get it. Um, but it illustrates the relationship between price and demand, because when prices are low, People line up, and there's a lot of demand. But what happens if prices are too low? If prices go too low, then some people can't compete. Like, I'm sure everybody knows that Toys R Us has filed for bankruptcy. Sears also followed suit. Um, who do you think? What happened? Like, why did both of those companies go out of business? You know, some people say it's one other company that put them out of business. The internet, the internet, and specifically, the other company that put them out of business was Amazon. Because Amazon has lower costs than Toys R Us or Sears. And Amazon doesn't operate a big, expensive uh, building at the Huntington Mall like both of those companies did. You know, they have to heat the building. They have to pay employees to stand around and wait for you to come shopping. Whereas Amazon, their efficiency is they don't heat their warehouses. They don't pay their, pay their employees very much. Uh, a lot of times it's a robot going and getting the thing off the shelf and putting it in a box for you. So it's tough to compete. So the prices got so low in some cases that companies couldn't keep up. So what we're going to be talking about is the relationship between price, demand, costs, and profitability. And uh, for us to do that, we have to begin with a little bit of terminology. Uh, first of all, when we speak of price, 
we think of that as an independent variable. So that's what a company can control. You can't directly control demand, but what you can control is how much you're selling your items for. And there are some sometimes uh, pretty like exciting examples of uh, price wars. You know, like over time, sometimes gas stations will get into like a war of lowering their prices further and further. That doesn't happen often enough, if you ask me. Price wars, but sometimes it happens on airline routes like where a new airline will start flying into a city and to try and stimulate demand for their services, they'll lower the prices. So, you know, maybe now, uh, let's say Southwest starts flying into Columbus, Ohio, and suddenly United and American have to lower their prices because Southwest started to. So price is the variable that can be directly controlled, and so that means it's uh, an independent variable. The dependent variable is the thing that um, isn't directly controlled. So it responds, meaning it's dependent on price changes. So demand is dependent on price. Price is independent because you can change it around, but then the dependent variable is, the one, is what responds to that change. And fill in the blanks. If price increases, demand will decrease. If price decreases, demand will increase. Now, how much will it increase or decrease? Different products have different elasticity, as it's called. Certain things, like gasoline, is relatively inelastic. That means that, for most people, the amount of travel you do is, uh, is kind of fixed. You know, you're going to have to continue buying gasoline to get to school, to get to work. And you may put off a few trips if gasoline prices go up. You know, you may not drive out, drive out to Fayetteville for the weekend. Um, but for the most part, gasoline is relatively inelastic because there isn't a huge change in demand with uh, an increase or decrease in price. But then some things are very elastic. And so the demand for t-shirts, maybe, is highly dependent on price where you're not going to buy one of those $1,000 shirts where it's got a couple of rips in it, and that's why it's $1,000. But um, if it's just an ordinary shirt, maybe you'd be more willing to consider purchasing it. OK, so it's important to know that general trend. And if we illustrate that trend graphically, and remember, graphs are important, because uh, I like to ask you to explain or to redraw a graph, the general trend is that if you want demand to increase, you have to have price decrease. And so that's what this graph is showing, is high price, low demand. Low price, high demand. So that's the trend. And in this case, just for simplicity, they're saying, let's assume a linear relationship. It's not always linear. And sometimes it's a curved relationship. But here, just for simplicity, what we could do is we could make an equation that relates how much price and demand affect one another. So in this formula, what we're, selling, what we're saying is that the selling price, you can determine the selling price um, with an equation where A is the intercept of the line. You know, this is the typical Y equals MX plus B except for since we have a sloped downward line, it's this minus sign because of the downward slope. So A is the intercept, and that represents something physical. It is the price where there's no demand. So for example, how much would you have to charge for a t-shirt, a ripped up t-shirt, before no one would buy it, like where there'd be zero demand? And you'd have to really raise prices pretty high, because there's always going to be uh, some rich doofus in like, Beverly Hills, who wants a $20,000 t-shirt. You just got to find that guy and sell him your t-shirt, right? Um, so there is some price, though, where there's no demand. And so you know, think about things that are a little bit less uh, exceptional than t-shirts. You know, if you're making circuit boards and you're in a market, like you're selling the circuit boards to PC manufacturers. So if you own a factory, there is a certain price where no one's going to want to buy your circuit board because there's nothing unique and stylish about it. It's just a commodity. That's what the intercept is, A. Now B, the slope of that line, 
It's the amount of demand increases for each unit decrease in price. So if you decrease your price by a dollar, how much does the demand increase as a result? So the slope of the line is essentially saying how much price affects demand. And then D is the number of units that are sold. It's the actual demand itself. So we could rearrange this equation and solve for D. That would be possible to solve for D in terms of price. But here, what this, the advantage of the form of the equation this way is it tells us what price we should set if we want to sell a certain number of units. So let's say that you have a company and you know the capacity of your factory for manufacturing circuit boards. You want to sell all of the circuit boards that you can manufacture. It'll tell you what price you should set so that you sell all of those units. But that may not necessarily correspond to maximum profit. So now we need to think about when you are selling all of those items, how much revenue do you get? So remember, D is the number of units sold, demand. Price, P, is the, uh, the selling price per unit. And so your revenue, TR, stands for total revenue. It's going to be the price that you sell each item for multiplied by the number of items that are sold. I mean, so that makes perfect sense that if you're selling circuit boards, your incoming money is going to be how much you sell each circuit board for and the number of circuit boards that you sold. So that's your revenue. This is pretty, you can prove all this stuff to yourself just in your mind, essentially. Um, so if you substitute in the equation for price, you could calculate the revenue in terms of demand. And remember that A, if we go back to the, uh, to the curve here, A is the intercept and B is the slope of the line. So what we're saying is take this equation for price, P, is A minus B times D. Substitute that in here, that P, and uh, we could get the revenue in terms of demand. You don't have to calculate the revenue this way. You can always find the price and then substitute price into the revenue function. But this is saying just combine the, the price function into the revenue function together. Any questions so far? All right, now here's where it starts to get interesting. Now we, we know how much money is going to be coming in, and we can graph that. So what this curve is showing is that if you sell very few units, if you sell very few units, your revenue is going to be low. Now, uh, down here on the left side of the graph, why is our demand low? Remember, we explain our demand in terms of price. So on the left side of the graph, why is demand low here? Price is too high. Yeah, so we have relatively low revenue over here because even though the price is high, we're just not selling very many units. Now what about at this other extreme, over on the right side of the curve? Demand is high. Why aren't we making more money? Why is the revenue low? The price is very low. So you're selling a lot of them, but you're just not getting very much revenue for each item that's sold. So there is a point, this D hat, this D hat, the definition of that is maximum total revenue. And so you can calculate that. It's A divided by 2B. Remember, A was the intercept of the price curve, and B was the slope of the price curve. So maximum revenue is a point that we can calculate based on the price function. But maximizing revenue isn't a company's goal. Does anybody want to guess what a company's goal is? It's been the same since the, the beginning of the semester. What do companies want to do? What do they want to maximize? Profit. Yeah. 
So how is revenue and profit different? They're not the same thing. Okay, so he said revenue is the total amount coming in. Profit's how much they make. So what's the difference? Like if we had a function, we've got profit equals what? Very good. Revenue minus cost. So we haven't talked about the cost of making these things yet. So that's what we're going to get to next is, so far we've only been talking about the price that we're selling the item for, how much demand there is at that price, and then how much money coming into the company arises out of that sale. But there are also costs. And costs have two components. There are fixed costs and variable costs. And taking the example for the, uh, the circuit boards a little bit further, um, if you buy the equipment to manufacture circuit boards, that's a fixed cost, meaning that you can make one or you can make a thousand, and your fixed costs stay the same, regardless of your level of activity. But the variable costs uh, change depending on how much activity you have. And so the variable costs are the variable cost per unit and the number uh, and then the demand, meaning the number of items that are being made and sold. So circuit boards. Uh, maybe you have to buy memory chips. Maybe you have to buy silicon. Maybe you have to buy um, solder and electrical wire. All of the components that are actually going to go into the item, and the more you sell, the more you have to buy. Those are the variable costs. So for a circuit board, maybe your variable cost per unit is $1.50 when you add up all of those component costs. And so then your fixed cost would be the total amount that you have to pay regardless of your level of activity. And that may include like rent for the building. Fixed costs could include the uh, capital cost for your manufacturing equipment. That could include like the insurance where it doesn't matter how active you are, you still have to pay some of those fees the same. But then variable costs could be like your labor expenses or electricity cost, and then, of course, the materials that go into the item. So profit, then, is revenue minus cost. And what a company wants to do is not maximize its revenue, it wants to maximize its profit. in the long term. In the short term, maximizing revenue is not a bad idea because it means that you're gaining customers, you're getting the word out. So in the tech industry, when a company is relatively young, it's not uncommon for them to operate at a loss for a lot of years. In fact, Amazon was not profitable for like the first maybe eight or ten years it was existing as a company. Uh, they were selling at a loss to try and get people's attention, to run other people out of business. Uh, and it's not, it was only in relatively recent years that Amazon became profitable. Um, Tesla was in the news recently because it finally had a profitable third quarter. Um, and so everyone was so astonished and pleased that finally Tesla is turning a profit. So what you want to do as a company is you want to maximize your demand. Now remember, D hat, that formula on the previous slide, that is the uh, maximum, that's the demand that corresponds to maximum revenue. This formula is the demand that corresponds to maximizing profit. So A is the intercept of the price line. This lowercase v is the variable cost per unit. And then B is the slope of the line. So those three factors tell us how many units we should sell to maximize our profits. The, the intercept, which is how many, you know, what would the price have to be for no one to buy any, minus the variable cost per unit, divided by 2 times b. So that, it seems weird that that would be the case, but we'll prove this to ourselves using Excel. We'll go through an example that uses each of these formulas and kind of illustrates how it works out. Last thing I want to tell you about, as far as formulas go, is the break-even points. And this complicated formula here, it tells you the minimum number of units that you have to sell 
to just barely break even, and then the maximum number of units you can sell, you know, once you've lowered your prices so far, um, if you really stimulate a lot of demand, there's a second break-even point. There are two break-even points. See how it says plus and minus in this formula? The plus or minus is what leads to there being two solutions to this equation. And so there's a first break-even point and a second break-even point. Let me, graphic, let me show you graphically what that works out to. So some of the stuff we've seen on this curve, other stuff's new. What did we already see? We already saw the revenue curve. And so that one, you already know. C sub F are the fixed costs. And you see that that C sub F line is horizontal. That means it doesn't matter if you make very few items or a lot of items. Some of your costs are fixed and are unaffected by your level of activity. Now, this other blue line is the total cost curve, C sub T. By the way, this is another example of a curve that you should, at the end of the semester, be able to reproduce from memory and explain. So you'd put the curves on there, you'd label them, and you'd basically you know, tell someone what's going on here. That shows a real proficiency with the concepts if you can reproduce a sketch from memory and explain the ideas. Uh, so C sub V is the variable cost. So the total cost is fixed plus variable. And that's what this graph is showing, is that when you have zero demand, the total cost is only the fixed cost. But then the difference between the two, this gap between the two curves, it's gradually getting larger as your number of items produced and sold increases. Now profit is the distance between total cost and total revenue. So you'll see this first break-even point, D prime 1, is the first time that the revenue and the costs are equal. So what happens if you're to the left of D prime 1? How's your business doing? Yeah, you're losing money. Why? Because your revenue is less than your costs. So therefore, you're below break even. So everywhere between D prime 1 and D prime 2, everywhere in this range is profitable. But look at where is maximum profit? Maximum profit isn't the same place as maximum revenue. Look at the, uh, the slope of the two curves. And the interesting thing is uh, right here, the two lines are getting further apart. The further apart those two lines are, the more profit you're making. Because profit is from the cost up to the revenue. So you shouldn't stop now, because these two lines are still getting further apart. And the further apart they get, the more money you make. We're still making more money. And so the point where these two curves are parallel, that is where they're as far apart as they're going to get. So that's why this is maximum profit. It's because the two curves have been diverging. They're parallel right now. This is the maximum profit. And any further to the right, and they start coming together again. And so the profits are getting smaller as you continue to make more than D star. Does everybody understand that from a graphical standpoint? That since we want this line to be big, this profit line, where is it the biggest? It's the biggest when these two lines are parallel. And when they're still getting further apart or when they're getting closer together, that's not the biggest profit. So again, just to, uh, to emphasize the difference between maximum revenue and maximum profit. Maximum revenue is that D hat formula, but D star is the point that generates the most profits. We are out of time. So we are going to continue this in-class exercise on the back side of the page is where we're going to do some calculations with profits and loss. So bring this to, to class on, uh, on Thursday. You don't need to know this stuff for the homework you're doing on Thursday. The homework that's due on Thursday is just all about bundling and capital rationing budget limit stuff. So I will see you on Thursday, and uh, have a good day.